Hello and welcome. We'd like to thank you all for joining us. Gear Technology Magazine, the Journal of Gear Manufacturing, published by the American Gear Manufacturers Association, is proud to present another in a series of educational webinars for the gear industry. I'm Gary Jesh, your moderator for today's webinar, and I appreciate having such a large audience of industry professionals here with us today. Many techniques have been developed over the years to control heat treatment distortion in gear manufacturing, including the use of different quenching media, optimization of heat treatment cycles, altering the material chemical composition, and even press quenching. Now learn about quenching in the fourth dimension. Today's material is presented by Seco Vacuum, a subsidiary of Seco Warwick Group, the technological leader in innovative heat processing solutions. Seco's expertise includes end-to-end -end solutions in vacuum heat treatment equipment and applications. And now to introduce our presenter, Tom Hart, the product manager for vacuum furnaces for Seco Vacuum Technologies. Tom will demonstrate today how quenching in the fourth dimension offers superior distortion control and hardening applications with the use of gaseous nitrogen. His responsibilities are to engage and support his partners in their understanding of concepts, processes, equipment, and infrastructure related to vacuum furnaces and their functions. Tom has a manufacturing engineering degree from Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania, and his thermal processing career is now in its 10th year. Prior to entering the thermal processing sector, his prior background was in precision manufacturing with extensive experiences in tool and die machining, heavy fabrication, R&D glass laminations, and cemented carbide industries. Tom also serves as an active member to AGMA, ASM, MTI, and IHEA groups as published numerous white papers for these associations. Thank you, Tom, for preparing this material. Let's get started. Thank you for the warm introduction, Gary, and uh, thank you to uh, Gear Technology and AGMA for inviting me to share our heat treatment solutions with you. And I especially wish to thank those of you around the world for attending this presentation. It's a pleasure and honor to be with you today. I'm going to have to be honest with you. I'm really excited to talk about 4D quenching. I've had the pleasure to work with this technology for the last five years. Well, actually, it's almost six now that I think of it. It's a proven solution, and quite frankly, it's really turning heads in the industry. And I can even tell you that, it's got, that it has unmatched performance and quality. So let's dive right into it. So as Gary mentioned, I'm, I'm here to tell you about how you can heat treat up to an 8 million distortion-free years per year in one piece of equipment. Now, that's a lot. So stay tuned to hear out how we can get there. And I will add that we are going to be pleased <clears throat> that we are going to be we're very pleased that you've attended this webinar. Your attendance tells me that you and your team are on the leading edge of material sciences and you know that there are better ways out there to thermally process and quench your materials. And as such, with a Unicase Master Furnace with 4D Quench, you're now able to have your cake and eat it too. And what does that mean? Well, this equipment offers high throughput with control distortions, where in traditional processes, you can only have one or the other. And in addition to the productivity and quality output, there are many other reasons why you, sh you should consider 4D quenching. Some of them include that you can now have true single piece flow versus batch processing. It's fully automated, where part handling and thermal processing take place without any operator intervention. Because it's a vacuum furnace, it has all the safety benefits associated with vacuum heat treating. And if that's not all enough, the system is completely environmentally friendly. Now, before I get into the meat and potatoes about 4D quenching, I want to spend a few minutes touching on how we got here. First, a, a bit about the background and capabilities of my team, Seco Vacuum, which is a Seco Work Group company. And as Gary mentioned, this is the team that's responsible for bringing 4D quench to life. Then I'll talk a, a little bit about the traditional methods of hardening, which naturally will lead us into explanations about current equipment options. 
Um, and then I'll divide that into two categories, one being the traditional approach and the second being the modern approach. Uh, I'll break down the pros and cons of these methods. And then finally, I'll transition back into the 40 coin system. Uh, of course, its benefits and uh, all of the, um, the, the great ideas associated with this revolutionary technology. As I just mentioned, the SQL work group is the group responsible for bringing 4D quenching to life. And it's made up of a remarkable team of engineers, fabricators, assemblers, technical staff, and management team, all working together as a cohesive group to bring world-class thermal equipment to our partners. And in addition to the 4D quench furnace, and generally speaking, the SQL work group is proud to offer five fundamental types of technologies including specifically today we'll be speaking about vacuum heat treatment but also they offer vacuum melting the thermal furnaces continuous atmospheric brazing or cab if you will uh, and aluminum processing so feel free to reach out to any of our technical experts and be happy to work with you on any thermal processing requirements you have and this speaking specifically about seco vacuum whom i represent we are the North American Division of SECA Work, which specializes in vacuum processes associated with various technologies such as low-pressure carburizing, nitriding, annealing, tempering, brazing, both copper, nickel, and aluminum, sintering, and carbon vapor deposition. We're also able to provide vacuum equipment in both high-pressure gas quench and oil quenching designs. My team here in the USA is fully staffed with engineering, project management, spare parts, field service, mechanical assembly, electrical assembly, services. And of course, like any good company, we're specialists and diversified in the marketplace, working with folks such as the aerospace, military, power generation, automotive, and tool and die, medical machine building and commercial heat treatment areas. Okay, so let's get into the hardening process and heat treatment. As most of you know, Hardening and case hardening heat treatment traditionally are performed in very well-known pieces of equipment, uh, including approaches such as batch integral quench furnaces, batch salt bath furnaces, press quenching techniques, and so on. Many of these applications utilize endothermic or nitrogen methanol atmospheres. Um, and in most cases, these systems will employ the use of oil baths for rapid quenching. These systems were designed for high volume manufacturing, batch processing, they're, they happen to be installed in separate departments, which also occupy large footprints, and they consume excessive amounts of utilities, which may not have been necessarily intended for case hardening. Batch processing associated with these pieces of equipment have several disadvantages, some which are simply just related to physics, where each piece of the load is exposed differently than its neighboring part in the batch. In terms of temperature, and if you're carburizing, the case depth and hardness after quenching. Negative impacts from this is that there are high variability and poor repeatability of the geometries and microstructures throughout each batch. But drilling down deeper when it comes to distortions, you'll find that batch quenching creates large temperature thermal gradients within the batch, and it also leads to large amount of thermal distortions from part to part. Several of those disadvantages include that you have uncontrolled distortion with poor repeatability, as I just mentioned. You have high material handling costs and the cost of the fixtures associated with material handling. You have low process and operation flexibility. You can't monitor individual pieces. And atmosphere processing in general uh, creates intergranular oxidation within the microstructure, or IGO, uh, because it's in an oxygen-rich uh, heating environment. Um, it also comes with a high cost of maintenance and safety requirements are such that uh, you have risk of fire and explosion. Uh, so safety is a big concern with these furnaces. You have costs that are associated with waste neutralization and then the environmental issues of all the byproducts that these furnaces produce. So to address the distortion issues specifically, press quenching process can be used um, on parts and applications such as, you know, case and through hardening of gears, rings, and bearings, which as you know, these parts are very sensitive to distortion when hardening. Press quenching is good for thin cross section and also parts with large dimensions, so it makes it pretty flexible. Um, in press quenching 
can give you the quality features where the the agma class difference can only change uh, one level from its green condition to post heat treatment. And ultimately, since um, it performs hardening on individual parts, its, its results offer dimensional stability and good repeatability. However, with any good cake, you want to eat it too, right? So this is going to be a recurring theme with maybe I'm, I'm hungry today being it's lunch time here. But remember that I said earlier, you can't have both. Well, in press quenching, there are also operational challenges associated with this technique. And I'll expand upon those here in, in a moment. First, with the heat up furnace, you've got gear quality issues associated with IGO. You have equipment safety issues with open fires and radiation and equipment environmental issues with carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide output. Second, after the heat up furnace, you must transfer the individual gear from the furnace to the press equipment where there are also uh, inherent issues there. You have operator safety issues as they're exposed to high levels of thermal radiation from the furnace and also from handling the gear when it's at temperature. And you have more quality issues with additional IGO during the transfer itself because it's leaving the furnace environment and out in the air to the uh, oil press itself. Third, with the oil press, it has safety issues related with the open fire. It has health and environmental issues associated with oil and vapor emissions, high costs associated with expensive, expensive quench dyes, uh, which are needed for each part geometry. And then fourth and finally, you have your parts washer, which is required for oil removal prior to tempering and post machining. And again, with this, you have uh, the wash process, which requires special chemicals and upkeep for system operation. And then lastly, there are the residual environmental issues associated with the neutralization of the washed oils. Okay, that's enough about press quenching in the traditional methods. I'd like to switch gears, no pun intended, to talk about modern vacuum heat treatment solutions, which are becoming more and more popular over the traditional methods that I previously discussed. Since low pressure carburizing has been introduced into the industry, in both aerospace and automotive markets, it's become quite obvious that this approach is a viable alternative to atmospheric case hardening, especially when it comes to the combination of high pressure gas quenching and low pressure carburizing and utilizing nitrogen and helium as the gas of choice for quenching. This technique is a drop in replacement to the traditional way of heat treatment and carburizing. But of course, there are still cases where oil quench must be used. And then let us remember that vacuum oil quench units have been produced over decades. So introducing low pressure carburizing technology into vacuum oil quench units goes hand in hand and it broadens the outreach of low pressure carburizing to other materials that may not have been suited for just your high pressure gas quench approach. And of course, depending on one's production size and type, either commercial or high volume, there are also, there are the following types of vacuum equipment that can be used. And again, starting with single, double, and triple chamber uh, furnaces, double being an in-out and triple being a straight through uh, furnace. And additionally, you can have multiple single chamber units with automated handling systems. And these systems can support the most rigorous of production demands. And of course, the benefits from vac vacuum heat treating, as you may well know, is that the process is more accurate uh, and the results of the uniformity and quality are, are much higher. You get a less quenching distortion. Um, as in high pressure gas quench, it's a less aggressive quench. You can have faster processing, i.e. with higher temperature carburizing. You have no intergranular oxid oxidation or IGO. And again, you get the ideal surface quality because it's a vacuum environment in which you're heat treating in. You get a reduction of energy and process gases and consumption emissions. And when you use high pressure gas quench, you, of course, you eliminate the use of oil, washers, and washing fluids. And then as in with vacuum heat treatment, it's, a, it's safe equipment with no open flame, and there's, of course, no risk for fire explosion. And lastly, as I mentioned previously, uh, it's a clean and environmentally friendly process. Again, however, both atmosphere and vacuum heat treatment are cursed with an inherent flaw. 
They require batches to make up their working volume for each respective furnace. This flaw has handcuffed production staffs who produce one part at a time, well, or maybe several at a time, depending on the machining center, only to group them up and generate a batch, just so that they can make best use of the furnace volume. While batch processing may appear to be straightforward, however, the result of the batch process, and in this case, I'm gonna to speak to case hardening, is that each part in the batch is exposed to different physical characteristics throughout, resulting in different exposures to temperatures, uh, time at temperatures, atmosphere exposure, and quench flows. Let's just simply pick three parts and try to compare the conditions under which they're being heat treated. And as you can see, the parts are heated on different conditions, which part number one being in the center of the batch is different than part number two, which is in the corner. And part number three is different from both because it's on the side. This can lead to an effective case step span of up to 20 thousandths, which leads to wide case step variation. Because since there's different conditions within the batch, the engineers must provide a wide, a very wide tolerance, I should say, so that all parts from the microstructure and hardness perspective are able to fall within the requirements that's been set forth. If an engineer provides too small of a tolerance window, he can put the manufacturing staff at risk to produce non-conforming materials within a batch, thus raising the overall cost to produce the gear. So an engineer must weigh both the form, fit, and function of a gear and the capabilities of the heat treatment equipment to produce a desired component. Additionally, I'd like to look at quenching a bit closer here. When we talk about the quenching process and its impact on distortion, we encounter a similar situation as we did in heating. So consider this, you have cooling gas flow inflow from the top of the part to the bottom, direction flow or one dimensional quenching, if you will, the part sees a large thermal gradient. So for example, let's say we have the most uniform gas stream possible. Would this mean that you have uniform cooling for every single part in the batch? Well, simply the answer is no, because we know that uniform cooling pays, plays a key role in lowering the distortion. However, how can uniform cooling flow equal lower distortions if the quenching gas flows from only one, uh, one direction. This slide articulates that uniform cooling from one side won't lead us to the lower distortion and the approach does not equally cool apart from all areas. And as illustrated here, we conducted a finite element analysis showing one-sided cooling of 20 bar of nitrogen with almost 35 miles per hour of cooling gas velocity. Because of this, it leads to a huge temperature gradient within a component or a gear, uh, approximately 900 degrees Fahrenheit from the external tooth to the core, which has a major effect on the distortion as the outside of the gear is contracting faster than the inside. Because again, the, the gear is expanded during the heating process and contracts and quenching. This generates massive forces, leaving the material with no choice but to distort unpredictably. Now, with all this being said, we can conclude that if we want to control and decrease distortions, uniform cooling is a must. However, if we only cool the part uniformly from, one, from uh, all sides, we need to cool it evenly, or at least from the sides that require cooling. So I've listed a number of disadvantages of batch handling for the last five minutes or so, and now pose the question, is batch handling the only way? Well, obviously, I wouldn't be here today talking to you if there wasn't another solution out there. And I'd like to add that batch heat treatment has controlled the green machine practices for far too long. Again, it's controlled the manufacturing process for far too long. So batch handling is not the only way to do heat treatment. And I'm proud to share with you that there is a revolutionary heat treatment platform that can thermally process and quench parts one part at a time in a single piece flow while eliminating distortion. And with single piece flow, you get the same process parameters, which ultimately equals the same results from every single part. 
And while you're here, thank you very much for joining me because I would like to dive into our Unicase Master with 4D Quench vacuum furnace. The 4D Quench Unicase Master Furnace is a precision case hardening furnace for high volume production with the benefits of distortion control. This is a state of the art piece of equipment available on the market and it brings high volume production into a, a higher quality level and will significantly reduce or even eliminate hard machining costs. And it will, in general, reduce the cost of production while increasing the quality. Here on this slide, we have the equipment uh, presented and it's installed in our research and development center um, in our manufacturing center of excellence in uh, our headquarters in Poland. The equipment has been running for over five years now and is available for real parts testing. And we have te been testing numerous, numerous clients' parts and, uh, and generating many positive results. And the idea is that the system is designed for single piece flow and it fits into uh, a machining work center between a rough machining and a, and a final machining work center. And it's very well designed for lean manufacturing. The parts are heated in, heat treated individually without fixtures, all in line. So the chain between soft machining and hard machining now have been bridged. So looking at the flow chart, you have 100% traceability of every single part that you produce. Gone are the days where you lose the traceability because every part goes into a batch where you produce the green part in your machining centers, the parts then transfer to a pre-wash, you have your individual part identification, you can then enter the uh, Unicase Master with 4D Quench furnace. Once it cycles through the, the, the hardening furnace, you can then go to a post-cooling or cryo operation, transfer and then to tempering operations, post-cool it and do some non-destructive testing. And then it can then leave the, the Unicase Master cell and then transfer on to its next steps. So with Unicase Master for dequenching, there's a number of benefits as opposed to the, your traditional atmosphere technologies. One being that you have, of course, automated inline manufacturing. Um, and you don't have to separate your heat treatment department now. It eliminates the batch material handling, obviously. And it also uh, spares production time because of this. You have improved process precision, resulting in higher quality and repeatability. And to specifically highlight that you have, again, the improved distortion control, high productivity with fast throughput, and down to the safety factor of it, there's no flames and no risk of fire explosion. And the system is very flexible and adaptable to one's needs. And I'll highlight that flexibility uh, here later in this presentation. All right, take a deep breath because you're going to have to listen to me on this slide for a few minutes. So how do we get there? There's a lot of information on this slide. So let's start out with just the title. We have 40 quench. What does it mean, right? It's made up of two combined approaches. First being 3D, where cooling gas is delivered by a nozzle manifold from all sides around a gear. And also the, the one dimensional, and that dimension is as the part rotates. So you're quenching it from all sides in three dimensions, and you're rotating the part at the same time too, giving you your fourth dimension. So there we go. We have quenching in the fourth dimension, guys. Here we are. Now, what does four di fourth dimension dimensional quenching mean, right? Well, it's extremely powerful efficient because you're focusing on one part at a time in a small chamber. It's extremely powerful because it utilizes 10 bar nitrogen, which is just as fast as oil quenching. And that means it has a heat transfer coefficient of 2000 watts per meter squared Kelvin, which is simply just the heat transfer coefficient um, label. So with the chart, you can see the 4D quench that lands in between your medium and fast oils. Well, what does that mean in relation to batch quenching in gas? Well, you have black, blue, and red lines that signify nitrogen, helium, and hydrogen. 
And we'll just speak specifically about nitrogen and helium because they're the more common gases that are used. And as you, as you see on the lower bar, uh, the, the, we'll call the uh, x-axis, you have your pressures, which the batch chamber can backfill to. And the dashed lines are at your single chamber at where a 14 bar or 15 bar absolute. And then you have 24 bar or 25 bar absolute. The 25 bar approach is typically uh, reserved for a dedicated um, specific chamber and not done in the thermal chamber. But as you can see, quenching in nitrogen at its maximum 25 bar capabilities can only reach, oh, say 1150 heat transfer coefficient. And 40 quench is still at 2000 with just simply 10 bar in a simple chamber. And it does it without oil or helium. So oil is, is a pain in, to work with and helium is very expensive as you all know. And then on the right, you can see some images and I'll illustrate this further, but the part transfers to quench and it proceeds through the quenching operation uh, and through um, its quench within nine seconds being below 500 C. Well, how does it work? Let's take a minute here to, to see this slide. Um, and you'll note that you have a cold inrush of nitrogen from the heat exchanger, which picks up the heat from a gear, and then it's returned back to the heat exchanger, and thus, then, then, thus can go back to the gear again, calling this basically a closed loop circuit under high pressure. So thus the cooling pattern, the cooling is controlled by the influence of the gas manifold pattern, the time at quench, the pressure of the quench, the velocity of the gas, and of course the rotation of the part, which again introduces the fourth dimension in quenching. Now, very important here, I want to make the following statement, and above all others, I want you to take this home with you. Well, you may be home already, but please take this home after this presentation. 40 quenching is a quenching process that is completely controllable, whereas in all other quenching techniques, it's an uncontrolled process. So let me repeat that again. 40 quenching is a quench process that completely control is completely controllable. And again, all other quenching techniques is an uncontrolled process. So as I mentioned before, I'm now allowed to go back on my recurring statement to which you can have your cake and eat it too now. Now with that, we can, we have controlled quenching, which giving a, gives us predictable and minimal distortion. So there's a lot of talk about descriptions and promises. Now I really wanna show you what it can do. On the top, we have an animated video of the process in general. And on the bottom, you can see an actual bevel gear being quenched. Notice thick, thick cross section. The part's backfilled, it's now quenching, the part temperature is now reducing from 1500 degrees Fahrenheit all the way down to 900 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's done within thir oh, just 13 seconds. This is amazing. Now, I want to show you this slide again because I want you to note how quickly and uniformly, uniformly the bevel gear quenches in the 40 quench chamber. Now, I don't typically show the same slide twice, but since I'm an avid sports fan, you may or may not be, I like to always see an instant replay and assume that you do too. So just absorb this video because it's, it's quite impressive. Now, we do this because of distortion. And in general, we can say that the single piece flow with 40 quench reduces distortion up to four times in comparison to traditional technologies. In the case of the spiral bevel gear shown in the previous slides, we have a straight comparison of an eight inch diameter where in red, we have the oil quenched or batch approach and gas quench single piece flow in blue uh, and the distortion and distortions regarding flatness, roundness and run out. And I'd like to highlight that the spread on the distortion change size is kept very narrow with 40 quenching. And this demonstration in particular, there were two series of parts, 50 uh, parts of 50. And the graph shows the total spread of the results, your minimum to your maximum. And here we did 
a 3D analysis of the bevel ring gear in its tooth form. The comparison between the traditional batch high pressure gas quench and single piece flow of the Unicase Master offered a five times, up to a five times less distortion for the parts heat treated. And in this evaluation, we did two series of 100 parts and they're broken down into the initial trial and the optimized trial where the quenching module was, design, was designed and had been changed to achieve even more precise results. So concluding that single piece flow can significantly reduce the distortion in its first attempt and even after more process optimization can be refined even further. And this graph again shows the total spread of your results, your minimum to your maximum. In here, we like to talk about the carburizing precision. Let's consider that the effective case step here, uh, the requirements were 32 thousandths plus 20 thousandths. That's your spread. You have a 20 thousandths window to hit. And that requirement's placed there because again, you're typically quenching with a batch. So you need that span so that all the parts can fall into spec. Our target was 35 thousandths on the case step. And we were able to put it within a plus or minus one thousandths of an inch tolerance. So not only do you get extreme distortion control, you, extremely precise distortion control, we get extremely precise carburizing precision. And to add to that precision uniformly, we could only had a mass increase a carbon absorption on this particular trial where we had a 2% precision of carburized, of sorry, of the carbon absorption within the gear. And it's extremely consistent, excluding the first part within the batch or with, within the trial. Um, but it can, tells you how everything's very consistent within its mass increase. All right. On this one, I don't want you to blink, so pay attention. We have an example of a coupling sleeve, which is a thin wall, thin wall cross section. And as you can see that the system is flexible to handle both thin and large cross section. And again, cooling the part 600 degrees Fahrenheit in just over six seconds. So having the flexibility from a large part to a small part, it can handle both very well. In this coupling sleeve, we, uh, we performed some dimensional inspections. And in its green condition, the, uh, the radial runout of the green component was only one thousandth of an inch average amongst all 20 parts. After case hardening in 4D quench, the, uh, the radial runout only measured 1.6 thou with a delta of six tenths. So this tells you that uh, it's, it's distortion from green to hardened condition is extremely precise and provides you with an Agma class 15 of gear quality. Let's look at the axial runout. Here we have two tenths runout when it was green. Now we have seven tenths runout when it was case hardened. Again, giving you an Agma class 15 gear quality. Okay, so that's 40 quench, distortion results, trials and tests. Let's talk about the equipment now. Unicase Master with 40 quench and its configurations. This system is very flexible and very adaptable. It can be resized for customer specific technologies, processes and throughput, right? And well, what I'll focus on more specifically today is uh, the options on your left-hand side, or in the middle maybe, if you will, on the slide. You have your low-pressure carburizing and high-pressure gas quench system, which is a multi-chamber, multi-level, multi-position furnace. And then I'll also highlight the single level, which is for hardening, uh, low-pressure carburizing, annealing, and so on. And it's a single chamber with multi-positions. Uh, additionally, this system can be configured in a multi-chamber single position, in a single chamber, multi, a single chamber and single position, maybe more designed for some R&D applications. But as I said, let's talk about this triple level that we have. Single piece flow, where you have an initial uh, inlet on your left, part goes in uh, the chamber, vacuum evacuates it. An elevator on your left-hand side will retrieve the gear 
as it's uh, once it's safely in a vacuum environment, it'll transfer it to its its uh, top level, your heat up chamber, and then it will uh, it will flow through the system uh, from the top level through the heat up under a walking beam style um, hot zone, and then the second elevator will retrieve that part from the top level. It'll subsequently take it to the middle layer, which is your LPC or low pressure carburetor boosting chamber. And in the middle chamber, it, the carbon gases are boosted and absorbed into the gear. And finally, once it's sent to the end of the line, it will then be retrieved by elevator number one on the left, taken to the bottom level, which is your diffusion level. Diffusion is when the carbon that's been saturated on the gear will now absorb into uh, the center of the part and it will cool down to the proper quenching temperature. And then the second elevator will retrieve it off the third, the lower third level, taking it to its 40 quench chamber, which I spent some time on prior to this explaining. And once it's quenched, it can then be removed for uh, post-cooling, uh, cryogenic processing, tempering uh, operations, and uh, hard machining if it's even required. Here we have the 40 quench with single level approach and uh, specifically designed for hard, uh, for austenization and high pressure gas quenching. Here you have the similar approach, but only one, level, one layer does not have the elevator design. It only has the um, material handling to the left and to the right of the hot zone where it retrieves from the purge chamber and the 40 quench chamber. In the following illustration here, we actually have a view of the heating chamber. And as mentioned, each heating level treats uh, a single level of parts. E each heating chamber, I should say, is a single level of parts. And once the part is transferred through the furnace, it'll be at its proper temperature. It'll finally then be retrieved by the second material handling system and sent on its way to either the low pressure carburizing chamber or its 40 quenching chamber. And benefits of this technique is that the part temperature in the heating chamber is extremely uniform from the surface to the core, which is what's important in our world. And in our uh, CFD heating curve simulation here, um, we have a difference in the temperature between the surface and the core. It's only 175 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's extremely tight uniformity between surface and core. Here I'd like to take a quick look at the installation overview. It's a nice and small, compact and efficient footprint, okay? And the pictures show that here are some of the minimum floor space requirements that you would need. Uh, specifically on the left-hand system, it comes with a, you know, the, the equipment itself, uh, the loading manipulator or robot, if you will, um, the, uh, the unloading manipulator, cooling station and temper furnaces. Um, the system on the right uh, simply just has your, uh, your transfer chambers, your heat up chamber and your 40 quench chamber. So it's compact and efficient, small footprints for both units and similarly sized to your, uh, your standard CNC machines. So um, again, just to give you a scale of magnitude on how these equipment are installed. And this table here is highlighting our size configurations. We have single level uh, specifications listed and triple level specifications listed. Uh, single level being um, a little bit more flexible with the sizing. Um, now, again, these are diverse, uh, very diverse units and we can customize them to uh, your specific needs, but out of the gate, here are some standard approaches uh, in which one could think about when considering a Unicase Master system. All can handle 2300 degrees Fahrenheit. All have a uniformity of plus or minus 10 F and can have a quenching pressure of 10 bar nitrogen. When it comes to the tack time, they vary based on geometry sizes and of course your, uh, your process requirements. But typically speaking, uh, if we look at the uh, lower two rows there, uh, we can achieve a, uh, a 60 second tack time and 30 second tack time respectively which can give you 500,000 or a million gears when you're processing one gear at a time. Well, you might ask yourself, well, 
you promised me eight million in the beginning of this presentation. Well, that is something I did do. And let's talk about that. So depending upon your geometry and technological requirements, here you can see where you can optimize the working envelope and get two and even up to eight million parts per year with your smaller size components. You can note how flexible that the system can be and tailored to your specific needs. So here's where you can really gain uh, some optimization on productivity from, you know, from your, your smaller geometries. So when we look at 40 quench versus press quenching, you get better distortion control and absolute precision and repeatability of the results because it's the same from part to part. You get a drastically improved safety uh, environment, safety environment with no risk of fire. The process is totally automated and it can be integrated with full single part traceability and reporting. It's flexible, it has on demand operation. You can turn it on and off. There's no, um, there's no conditioning of this furnace. It has no human involvement or impact. As I mentioned before, it's got a compact footprint. It eliminates the need for press quench tooling. And because of the vacuum heat treatment process, there's no decarb or IGO in the parts of clean surfaces, all because of its, it's all under a vacuum environment. It's done in nitrogen quench, which oils or expensive helium is needed. You eliminate high temperature radiation. Uh, you eliminate the oil, oil vapor contamination, the associated washers and cleaning chemicals needed for post cleaning. And I repeat again, it's safe and an environmentally friendly piece of equipment. So, Unicase Master and 40 Quench, what do we have here? We've got lean manufacturing with high throughput at a low cost, integrating into continuous productions, zero cost of heat treatment fixtures, zero cost of logistics. You don't have to send them, you don't have to machine the parts, send them away to other uh, heat processing facilities or locations. You have single piece flow, which is up to a 10 times improve, improvement in your precision and repeatability, 100% traceability, and you can actually test the parts in line after case hardening now and know which part it is that you're testing. You have inline manufacturing. You have the high accuracy and quality up to four times less distortion, distortion variation and less hard machining time or you eliminate them altogether. It's a great platform for noiseless drives and your e e-car, e-truck, e-transit markets. I just told you how flexible uh, the system is and adaptable it is because it's modularity, it's multiple configuration, and it truly allows you to fully optimize the operation, the technology and process of the heat treatment for each specific gear. And it fully in integrates with Industry 4.0 Internet of Things and all this, all these data collection platforms and evaluations that are, are out in the marketplace that people are doing for their uh, all the different machines that they are installing in their their facilities. Long gone are the days of um, no data, right? So the system is fully integrated into your data collection systems so that um, everybody can evaluate the performance of the equipment. And finally, I'm going to close with this last statement. This Unicase Master, when it's equipped with 40 quench, is a truly remarkable piece of equipment. It's on the cutting edge of material silence, and it's the modern alternative to batch hardening and press quenching. So, and with that, I can conclude my lecture for today on 40 quench, and I thank you, I thank the Agma Group and Gear Technology Mag Magazine for this opportunity. At this point, I will turn it back over to Gary for the question and answer sessions. Great job, Tom. Thank you very much. Uh, imagine this world would have been very much different place uh, had this technology been around for the last hundred years or so, right? Sure. Exactly. So I do have questions here for you. Um, and uh, folks, you can keep on sending the questions in through the uh, 
questions tab on your GoToWebinar control panel, and we're going to do our best to get through everybody's questions while we're in the show here today. We'll go over, we may end up going over the hour, uh, but we'll do our best to make sure everybody gets an answer. Starting out then, um, we do have uh, Travis who has asked us, um, what about shafts? Uh, can gear shafts be processed in this technology? Good question, Travis. Um, it obviously depends upon your, um, conf your well, your geometry. Uh, I'll I'll back up a couple slides here if I can. Um, as of now, if your shaft can, um, sorry, I went too far. Here are some of the uh, specific geometries in which we uh, we can handle at this point. Um, 20, 20 inches long, six inches of diameter is our largest. Uh, uh, offering at the moment. However, um, as I mentioned before, it's a, it's a flexible unit, and uh, if we get to the point, if you share your information with us, we can take a look at it and uh, see how that uh, helps you with your your operations. But uh, shafts can be considered, but you, you you there are some limitations when it comes to that. Let's stay on this slide for a second, Tom, if you could. Sure. Um, we've had a couple of questions about the largest gear, so let's just go back and touch on that again. That's the great. Well, um, uh, for a uh, for a single level uh, device, uh, we or single level system, we have it set here at uh, 20 inches in diameter by six inches tall. Is uh, is is the height of okay, what, and then. That Size, but again, your your number of positions reduce, of course, uh, within the unit itself when you when you increase the size. Okay, yeah, definitely. And then, how about maximum cross sections? Is there a limit to the the thickness or the cross section of the gear part? Uh, only up to uh, what you see here. Okay, if you can put a solid block in there. Um, of it course, would... as you know, you put a solid block into a, a batch furnace, and um, it's going to cool slower. But with the uh, the cooling manifolds and the um, 40 quench all associated with the quenching chamber, um, you're going to get uh, faster quenching results, more uniform quenching results. And uh, yes, it can handle that. Uh, but of course, it's I hate using this word, but it depends. You know, you have to let me know what your um, uh, what your material is. Um, and and yes, you you have your cross sections here that uh, you know if you put a solid billet in there, well that's uh, uh, it, it can take it. However, you just it has to also fit within the uh, the mass requirements too, right? We have 22 pound mass here, so uh, it has its limitation in, in material handling. When I say limitations, it can be sized bigger if needed. Uh, however, you have these uh, these these uh, levels of specification, I should say. Right. So your customers can review the details of their projects and the parts that they're making uh, with you to find out if it's an appropriate solution for them. Uh, right? Of course, Gary. But yes, yeah, so you can see here the, the the of course this is just the uh, the limitations of the systems we have in place. Uh, again, we're not limited by this. However, it's just sort of a gauge and a guide for those of you at the, at this point. But we of course will be happy to look at your specific case and uh, get you into the right system that uh, would give you the optimum performance. So um, just out of curiosity, how many of, of these Unicase Master uh, systems are um, installed uh, worldwide now? Do you have an idea? Do you know the number on that? So there are several units installed. We have uh, one, two, uh, third being built. Uh, the fourth one's being built currently. So really a new innovative technology we're looking at here. Yes, I'm it, sure it'll do I, well. I don't know if you caught it earlier, Gary, but uh, we've been working and developing this this technology for over five years now. Um, yeah. So it's actually had its chance to mature uh, and it's not necessarily your, it's new to the marketplace because people are now starting to learn about it. However, um, it's not new from a process perspective. Uh, it's been, been very well developed and it's now uh, in its mature state for sure. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Okay, uh, Travis has another question. Um, how is part proliferation handled in this system, Tom? He's referring to changeover from one part type to another. Oh, it's very simple. Uh, well, we can get into the specifics of this, but um, everything's easy, accept, easily accessible and adjustable for uh, part change sizes. Okay. And uh, can uh, 4D quenching be integrated to existing high volume continuous gas carburizer furnaces? 
gas uh, 40 coins, you would have to, it would be, uh, it can be, yes, uh, but it would be more associated with maybe like a reheat and quench type uh, uh, platform. And, and in that case, you may be more looking at a single level uh, UCM design versus uh, a triple level. So yes, you could, you could carburize, heat up and slow cool, and then we can introduce it into uh, a 40 quench uh, system and then reheat it and harden it. Yes, so okay. this, is, this is something you can do. Okay, um, let's see, uh, Rohit asks, what will be carburizing and diffusion time for average case depth of 0.9 millimeter? Oh, that's a pretty, pretty specific yeah, question about, there, isn't it? Um, that's gonna have to be looked at a little bit more closely, uh, technically. Um, okay. Uh, Tom, why don't you go ahead and uh, you can follow up with Rohit and on this question, and then there might be others that uh, you'll need to, but we'll make sure that you get a, um, a copy of all the questions. Sure, and and for that to, to answer that, just to just touch on it, I should say, yeah, we would just need to look at your specific uh, materials. Um, obviously, it depends. And as anybody in heat treatment says, well, it depends, right? You know, I can I can the deeper your case step, you know, uh, the tack time might extend further. But you can you can offset that by a different different construction of the furnace, maybe extend it longer. Um, so there's ways around reducing uh, tack times, um, but the, the system can is as fast as 30 seconds um, from part to part, and that's uh, limited not just from the technology, but some of the mechanical aspects associated with the furnace. Uh, throughput being the uh, watchword here, right? <laughs> sure. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay, um, let's see, uh, Tom asks, uh, do you have a method for performing uniformity surveys? Uniformity, uh, you'll see, I don't know if you noticed it uh, before, we can, it has multiple zones of control uh, with thermocouples um, in the furnace. Um, and yes, we can um, perform a uniformity survey, absolutely. Um, and it's just done in a non-traditional way. Okay, uh, Brendan has several questions. I'm gonna go ahead and present them all to you at once and then you can okay. let me know uh, how you wanna handle it. Um, sure. In the slide that's showing three to five less tooth form distortion percentage, do you recall mm -hmm. that one? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Brendan asks, how is the process optimized? What are the levers on the equipment? Top versus bottom quench gas flow pressure, others. Uh -huh. So he's getting it. He's getting this pretty specific. I'd love to chat with him off offline, and we can get okay. into some more uh, specific details on how all of that's optimized. All right, sounds good. Basically, okay. basically, Gary, you know, we took our first stab at it with a standard approach, and then uh, saw the results and improved upon it um, in our subsequent trials. And the levers is that is he speaking about the uh, places where the rotation. Uh, component of your system I, is touching I, I, the gear? Say, I, I can assume, but I don't know. Maybe he's speaking about the manifolds. Um, that I don't know. So maybe he say, can, uh, can talk offline and we can address all of those, um, those concerns. Okay. Thanks, Brendan. We'll uh, be sure that uh, Tom will get back to you on I'll, that. I'll get back to you on that one, Brendan. We'll, we'll get more in detail about it. Yeah, yeah. Now, I think that you've discussed this in a previous slide um, regarding the distortion after 4D quench. Do you want to just hit that one again real quick before we go on to our next uh, uh, question? Distortion after 4D quench, for example, here where we have the change in this example, this is a coupling sleeve. Um, yeah. We had, when you threw, when you put the indicator for radial run out, on your green component, you measure it, you get one thousandths run out. After we 4D quenched the component, uh, we had uh, basically a thousand and a half or uh, one thousand six tenths of run out. So the change was only six tenths of an inch. Um, and, and again, a thin wall cross section that is very prone to distortion, especially right. with the internal uh, teeth on the, the coupling. So you're looking at AGMA class 15 on all yeah. of these uh, levels, aren't you? All these yeah. directions. In this, in this, in this particular uh, demonstration, yes. 
Yeah, yeah. Okay, good job. Um, let's see, I think you answered this earlier, 20 inch diameter, the largest diameter that can be processed. Yeah, it, it's not the largest, but that's where we're currently, no, not, um, yeah. That's a pretty good sized gear too, isn't it? Yeah, uh, and again, it, it can be, it can be even larger. Um, can be even larger, okay. Yeah can be so again right. as i mentioned we're a fully uh our group consists of a, a large i don't think i told you this but we're our teams are associated with 60 percent engineers so our group is very well diversified with our engineering staff and we're able to tackle even the most challenging applications all right there you go um and neil uh, asked that question and he also asked are there any commercial heat treaters using this equipment in canada currently specifically Ontario but feel free I'd, I'd love to talk to you about being able to uh, get some some demonstrations done for you um, again it's, it is newer to the marketplace but the, the technology is very mature so we uh, we have a couple installations but unfortunately they are uh, all captive so um, if you the, the commercial heat treaters are, are warming up to the idea, but uh, we haven't quite uh, put one in one of their facilities yet. But Ben and well, Matt, we've several discussions with these uh, these groups, the commercial heat treatment market. Um, so just finding right. the right uh, solution for them. Well, maybe Neil's headed to be a commercial uh, heat treatment uh, provider for you. Um, uh, and uh, Papana asks how many installed in India? <laughs> Do we have one in India? Not uh, no, yet. we don't have any in, in, in India yet. Okay. Um, our next question is, can you guarantee the variation of the parts after treatment? So yes. I guess he's asking about uh, distortion and variation, right? And uh, all of your tests have indicated that uh, you're right there with a GMA 15 or better. Right? Yeah, we, we can we can guarantee this, yes, because um, you know within certain levels, of course. But distortion control is exactly what this system is predicated on, and you'll see you'll see whenever we do a demonstration for you, you'll give us your our first opportunity to perform, and we'll we'll give you far better, less distortion levels than you already are achieving, first of all. And then once optimized, it becomes even less distortion. And going back to this idea of controlled quenching versus uncontrolled quenching, right? Mm -hmm. yes, Good job, sorry. okay. Now, um, David asks, can the quenching media be contained, cleaned and reused or recycled, or do you have to continually purchase nitrogen? Um, typically we purge it out, yes, but reclaiming systems can be, uh, can be used. Nitrogen is not so expensive. And again, we're, we're filling a very small chamber. So we're really optimizing the utilities, not just in essence, throwing it away in, in, in empty volume, right? So, um, first of all, your consumptions are far less and, but yes, you can put this into a nitrogen regeneration system, uh, but Again, those are pretty expensive and you have to weigh the costs of that equipment uh, and with, uh, you know, in relation to the, the, the cheap costs of nitrogen itself. So the answer is yes, but you need to do a, a return on investment analysis, whether it's worth it or not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right, right. Um, let's see, uh, Brendan comes back with another question. Can an inline D oil and or pre-oxidation chamber be added? Uh, yeah, but you would you would put a pre-washer in place if you remember in the um, uh, the steps of sequence it, a pre-wash is required because as in any vacuum furnace the parts have to be clean dry before they go in otherwise the byproducts of the uh, the cutting fluids or whatever you have on your part will will be absorbed into the vacuum furnace and um, and the insulation and such and and cause you know quicker maintenance levels so. Inline washes have to take place. They have to be dry. Yes. Um, if you needed to do a pre-ox, um, we have not uh, not worked with this yet, but um, I'm sure that's something that could be considered. Um, we, we make pre-oxidation chambers in some of our other multi-chamber solutions. Um, again, hasn't been asked yet, but uh, uh, perhaps could be, con could be considered. So I won't say no, but I won't say yes. <laughs> but but is not, not outside of our comfort zone, so that's that's why I'll say uh, it depends again. <laughs> there you go. Well, it but, sounds like you again, know that all we need to do is is look at the specific requirements of yeah. 
what you have and and we can make a full evaluation well and this is the the because you're a leader in the industry you're willing to take on things that uh just haven't kind of been uh solved yet right sure. yeah we're, we're very good at uh you know finding solutions to the most difficult challenges within you know thermal processing it's uh it's something that we excel at Excellent. Uh, so uh, speaking of that, um, Coleman asks, uh, which alloys have you trialed on this system? Uh, lot of, it's, it's a lot of carburizing alloys. Let's, uh, you know, your, your 8620s, your European styles. Uh, we, we demonstrated some pyroware. Um, uh, so lots of carburizing steels, um, hardening steels too. So um, we have a, quite a library there. So. Uh, and again, we can we can discuss some of those offline uh, as, as they as you need. Okay, and uh, it looks like my last question here, Tom. And uh, thanks everybody. If you do have a question uh, now, would be a good time to submit it because we're going to go ahead and uh, wrap up here uh, shortly. If we don't have any more questions, um, and this one was about uh, you know uh, pr productivity mm -hmm. in terms of putting the parts on trays. Uh, mm -hmm. He asks how parts are rotated when more than one are loaded onto the same tray, and then does the tray rotate? You can, uh, and the tray could rotate, uh, or you could have, a, again, the nozzle manifold uh, specifically sized uh, so that you could get the, the, uh, the optimal quench profile. So it's all, it's all in how you uh, set up your manifolds. And that's the manifold for the um, nitrogen that's uh, coming yeah, into the chamber, yeah. right? It, yeah, exactly. You saw the uh, the whole patterns in the, in the video. Uh, that that's your manifold. So. All right, all right, great. Well, listen, um, I think we're going to wrap it up. Uh, Tom, thank you so much. We appreciate this information you have for us, as well as the time that you spent putting it all together in such an interesting way. So, uh, folks, you can see right here on this last slide that you can uh, reach back out to Tom uh, for more information about this uh, technology from Seco Vacuum. Tom dot Hart at SecovacUSA.com or a phone number here, either email or phone. And um, we'll going to forward those other questions over to Tom. And uh, so folks on behalf of Gear Technology Magazine, I'm Gary Jesh. I thank you very much for attending and we hope you'll come back soon. Thank you much, Tom. You know, thank you, Gary. Have a wonderful day and everyone else as well. All right, great. Take care everyone and have a great day.